During the anxious years between the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 and the surrender of Japan to the Allies in 1945, the AKC Gazette reported on the dogs of war. The photographs that accompanied those reports, many creased and brittle with age, still reside in the Gazette archives. The stories behind these photos are part of the sprawling history of World War II. Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, home of the now legendary Marine Corps Devil Dogs, is a good place to start. It was here that teams of dogs and handlers were trained for service in the long campaign to liberate the islands of the Pacific from the Japanese. Commanding Officer Captain William Putney, writing decades after the war, called the Doberman Pinschers and the German Shepherds that came through Camp Lejeune the best trained dogs the Marine Corps would ever have. War is always an ugly business, but combat in the South Pacific was especially brutal. The combined casualties of combatants and civilians in the Pacific were estimated to be a mind-boggling 36 million. The devil dogs trained to work in this tropical hell did patrol, sentry, scout, and messenger duty. Amphibious landings were essential to the island-hopping campaigns of the Pacific, and at Camp Lejeune, these were among the maneuvers practiced again and again. Scientists, engineers, plumbers, pastry chefs, anyone with a useful skill was expected to do their part in winning the war. Professional dog trainers and handlers were no exception. This is Second Lieutenant Bob Forsythe and his devil dog, Liney. A handler of show dogs by the time he was eight, Forsythe spent three years in the Marine Corps Canine Corps. He served in some of the Pacific's bloodiest campaigns, including the Long Battle for Guam, where 25 devil dogs were killed in action. Liney twice saved his handler's life by alerting on snipers. Thanks to his dog, the young Marine made it home alive, and as a renowned handler and judge, Robert S. Forsyth became a key figure in the growing popularity of dog shows during the post-war boom years. Another devil dog handler with a dog show pedigree was technical sergeant Tom Gately. Before the war, Gately had already established himself as a top terrier man. He too would make it home to resume his career. He lived to old age as a revered elder statesman of the sport, and it was said that as a judge he ran his ring with the authority you'd expect of an old marine sergeant. On the home front, the American dog fancy served the war effort by organizing Dogs for Defense, a program that encouraged breeders to donate dogs to the military. Among its organizers was Hayes Blake Hoyt, a wealthy society matron famous for her line of elegant standard poodles. The glamorous Mrs. Hoyt, in her trademark white gloves, is seen here on the grounds of a dog show urging her fellow fanciers to support Dogs for Defense. One who answered the call was... Rose Wakeley of Waterbury, Connecticut. In 1942, her Doberman, Otto, was accepted by the Devil Dogs. Two years later, Otto was officially a hero, commended for an outstanding performance of duty during the savage battle for the Solomon Islands. Otto indicated on a sniper's nest and saved the lives of fellow Marines, including Privates Marvin Troop and Henry Deneau, pictured here. A 1944 press clip of Otto's exploits concludes, He has been in continuous action since then, living in foxholes and performing his duties under fire. Dobies and German shepherds did much of the war's dirty work, but dogs of many breeds answered the call of duty. In this publicity photo staged for the AKC Gazette, an Afghan hound works alongside a German shepherd as a military police dog. This is Boots, the parachuting bulldog a familiar face at Randolph Field, Texas, where Air Force pilots trained for combat. The unlikeliest canine hero of the war was Smokey, a Yorkshire Terrier owned by Bill Wynn, an aerial photographer stationed on New Guinea. At seven inches tall, Smokey was hardly a devil dog, but in one of the best feel-good stories of the war, she completed a mission beyond the ability of any Doberman. There was a dire need to run telephone wires through a drainage pipe laid beneath a runway, the Army engineers couldn't tear up the asphalt. It would take days and leave aircraft open to enemy bombers. So, a string was fastened to Smokey's collar, and she crawled underground through 70 feet of 8-inch pipe. The string was then used to pull through the heavier telephone cables. 
The little terrier went to ground a pet, but she emerged as four feisty pounds of American hero. Bulldogs and Yorkies weren't the only ones serving in unexpected ways. The chronic wartime shortage of manpower gave women the opportunity to shine in unaccustomed roles. Elizabeth Ann Howard of Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, was a stenographer at Philadelphia's Quartermaster Depot. She applied for and received a promotion to sentry work, and she did her job proudly with an Airedale Terrier canine named King by her side. Here's a beautiful song we've asked the solid airs to sing for all you men. It's called My Buddy. This is Ted Fiorito, sincerely hoping you like it. During the war, a popular song from way back in 1922, My Buddy, became a hit all over again. Top band leaders and singers made new recordings of the song for the boys overseas. The sentimental lyric resonated with soldiers and sailors far from home in places where a true buddy, human or canine, was something to be cherished. The war was a long, hard slog for combat troops. They sought relief from alternating waves of terror and tedium. A popular diversion was to take in mascot dogs, strays whose civilian owners were killed or displaced by war. They weren't government issue, but in their way, mascots performed a vital service. They made life a little more bearable. G.I.'s adopted dogs at every turn, wrote one historian, and the photographs of their friendships worked their way back home. Military press officers fed these snapshots to stateside newspapers as a way of boosting morale on the home front. Today, historians of the war have a term for these dog and soldier pictures. They call it buddy photography. As the years pass, fewer veterans of World War II remain to tell their stories. It's up to us who still benefit from the sacrifice of those who made it home and those who didn't to preserve these memories and pass them forward. In the grand scheme of things, some fading old dog photos aren't much, but out of such threads are woven the vast tapestry of history. <laughs> <laughs>